Good morning. Welcome to church, everyone. It's a beautiful rainy day. The rain makes the grass grow. If you didn't cut your grass yesterday, you get a day off today. That's okay. It'll still be there tomorrow. <laughs> I wanted to uh, speak from Psalm 100, verse 1 and 2 today. It's one of Dee's favorites. It's one of her mother's favorites. It's Psalm 100, one, verse 1 and 2. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. So I'd invite you all to stand and sing with us this morning. We're going to come into the Lord's presence with singing and worship and a wonderful message and a great time to be together. Our first song is uh, Come, Now is the Time to Worship. seated. I have one announcement to uh, let everybody know. I just have some information about the Iowa Bible reading, which is next Sunday, 714, to uh, just, I guess, go along with uh, 2 Chronicles 714. Uh, it's going to be at 1.30 in the afternoon, and we do have some information on the table and on the, on the entryway if you want to take a look at it, or if you have any questions, just ask me. But 1.30 next Sunday at the county courthouse, we're going to be getting together, doing some worship and prayer and, and read the Bible at the courthouse. So just keep it in mind. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Sean. Good morning. Um, the announcements in your bulletin this morning are uh, right on point. Everything that's pertinent for the next two or three weeks is in there. Uh, what I want to do this morning is kind of clarify. Um, last week, we had a text go out about Mary uh, Vanderclay moving to uh, the hospice house. 
Um, that was a precautionary move. Uh, it, I don't want anybody to read into that that it, it was a, a dire uh, situation. Mary is still terminal, don't get me wrong, but her move to Hospice House last week was precautionary. It, a lot of the things that she has to have done for her at home, Paul was having trouble doing, and then Paul has a work schedule he has to keep too. So they just thought, you know, to be cautious, and then while he's at work, she would have somebody to look after her close, more closely. But she's in great spirits still. Uh, she communicates all the time. So, uh, you know, like I said, she's still terminal. We still pray for complete healing there. But it, it was nothing to get excited about. And, and Steve is... Uh, is aware of that. I, I made him aware of the situation too. So we're all on the, on the same page. So uh, I just want to thank Brian this morning for Sunday school. What a, a wealth of information that was. I, I really appreciated that. And to remind you that we are, this is the first Sunday. We have three Sundays left before Steve's sabbatical is over, which is good news for me. <laughs> but anyway, um, continue to pray for Steve and his journey. Um, but, uh, the schedule is we're, next week we'll get back to some, uh, some normalcy. We'll have regular uh, Sunday school next week, and I think Troy Vandaloon is, is, will be preaching next week and, and the following week. So we'll get back to some form of normalcy. Okay, for scripture this morning, Steve has asked uh, Brian and I to refresh your memories and, and help you look forward to uh, the upcoming finishing of the series in Mark. So this morning we're going to look at Mark chapter 6, starting in verse 45. A uh, little background, this is this is where Jesus walked on water. This is preceded by the, the uh, feeding of the 5,000. This is what follows that. So uh, Mark 6, 45. Immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida. Well, he dismissed the crowd, and after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth hour, about the fourth watch of the evening, <clears throat> he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass them by, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out. For they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. And they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the, the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. If you'll join me in a, in a word of prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the rain. Thank you for uh, the Smiths uh, being here this morning and, and, and opening the word for us and, and encouraging us uh, through their ministry in South Africa. Uh, Lord, we lift up those in our body that are, are hurting. We think of Donovan and, of course, Mary and Roger. And Edna, you know, just for especially for those people that have physical issues, but more so for those people that have issues that we don't know about. You, Father, as the great physician, know know it all, and we just ask you to be gracious uh, with those people. 
Again, thank you for this opportunity to come and worship you. And, and we ask a special blessing on Brian as he opens the word this morning in, the, in our second service that, that uh, our eyes would be opened, our hearts would be warmed, and we would be uh, willing to listen and continue. And, and now as we continue and worship in song, we give you praise and glory and thank you for everything that you do for us. In the name of your son, Christ, amen. amen. word that God put on my heart this morning for our, our, our continued worship is from Romans chapter 10 verse 13 and 14 and that says for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed and how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard and how are they to hear without someone preaching and that was on my heart as we as we have our missionary friends here today how are they to hear without someone preaching? We're, we're so thankful that we do have people that are preaching the word of God. I'd invite you all to stand and sing with us. We have a couple of hymns to sing today as we get into our message. I think you'll, you should know them. Uh, the first one is In the Garden, and our second one will be I Love to Tell the Story. So join, join me in singing uh, as loud as you can, because <laughs> I'm not sure I can do it. No, I'm sure I can. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear the Son of God discloses and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known he speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet the birds hush their singing and the melody that he gave to me within my heart song always makes me think of uh, Genesis when it said that Adam would walk with God in the cool of the morning. Oh, it's just such a pretty thought to think about God walking with us, just being our friend. This song is called I Love to Tell the Story, and it, God put this on our heart as uh, we have our missionaries here. Um, we know that they love to tell the story, too. Tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story because I know it is true. It satisfies my longings as nothing else can do. Tell the story. 
tell the story more wonderful it seems than all the golden fancies of all our golden dreams. I love to tell the story, it did so much for me, and that is just the reason I tell it now to thee. seated. Well, as, as Connie mentioned, it's halfway through our, our pastor's sabbatical, and we pray that he's getting exactly what God intends for him to get from all of this time. And uh, we are just blessed today to have uh, Brian Smith and his family here. They are uh, missionaries with Independent Faith Mission in South Africa. They've been there for some time. I talked to him about this. I, I, I knew I wouldn't be able to recite the time, but uh, they've been in South Africa for since 2017. This this trip, and this they were in Johannesburg before that, in the Caribbean before that. So they they have a calling on their life. We're we're so blessed that we have people like that 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 answer the call. Uh, we have the privilege of partnering with them to advance the gospel in the world, and uh, we're so thankful that that they can come and, and share with us today. I know that they shared in the equipping hour before church, and and. Brian's going to share with us a little bit more today. So we welcome you. Thank you so much for coming, and, and God bless you. All right. I greet you all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's good to be with you folks here at New Life here in Tama, Iowa. And, uh, you know, there's some, some wonderful memories for us here uh, over the years. I love what you've done with the auditorium, the way you've, you've fixed it up well. And it's good to see new faces, some old faces, Brother Wayne. Thank you for your faithful uh, letters to us, and thank you to all. So if I didn't get to greet you yet, please uh, come and shake my hand so I can be blessed to know you. Uh, out at our table, I want to remind you, you can come and get um, a copy of one of the prayer cards recently, uh, the letters that our mission puts us. We also have bookmarks with Bible verses. You can have those and give them away and witnessing to people if you'd like, as well as uh, a prayer card. So just uh, take a picture. Now, if you have more than one refrigerator at home, take two. If, you know, if you fidget the refrigerator, you see us, oh, say a quick prayer for Brother Smith in South Africa. We'd appreciate that a lot in a lot of ways. A um, uh, couple of history things I just want to say before I start preaching this morning. i got to do this. Uh, this Bible I hold in my hand, my wife gave me on uh, uh, Christmas 1991. I bought this Bible when I visited Faith um, Baptist Bible College. That's the college that joined my college joined that college from Colorado uh, um, many years ago. That's, that's 
similar to, so it makes me sort of an alumni there. But I was at the bookstore today. I found this Bible. I love this Bible. I've had it since 1991 and preached all of it uh, regularly, not only uh, around the world, but but uh, on the radio in the Caribbean on my uh, Hope of Glory broadcast. And some of the things that are in here, when I look through this, especially as we travel through Iowa, you know, uh, different memories that, that, that I see, you know, different dates. I write the dates of when I was there. And I have a date in here of many, many years ago when I was at this church. And maybe it had been the first time. It might have been our first meeting, I think I recall. And they, uh, I, 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 was, I was amazed at the, the, the love of the Lord that was shared with me. In fact, I was given a kiss. The letters K-I-S-S. I was told if you keep it simple, you'll get support. Keep it short and simple, you'll get support. And it must have worked because you've been supporting this. So, so if you're worried about how long I'm going to preach today, I don't know what your lunchtime is, but I, Steve did, Pastor Steve did give me the, day, the, the requirements, say, so I try to stay within that, understanding how that's important uh, for everybody. So praise the Lord. Good to have you this morning. Um, and and uh, let's just um, go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll go to church. Heavenly Father, we love you today. Because you first loved us when we weren't so lovable and we were lost in sin. But thank God that you sent a Savior to die from our place and that we might have forgiveness of sin and eternal life for we put our faith in him. Lord, it is just an amazing thing. We serve an amazing God, a powerful God. We serve a, a God uh, with the truth, a God that is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that same God is requiring us today to respond to his word. So today I pray you would put me behind the cross, put Christ forward today in your word that we might glorify you. We want to pray for Pastor Steve as he's away, as I know his dear folks are doing. Keep him and his family well. We thank you for his encouragement to us and and his love for the Lord and his missionaries like they do. And so, Lord, it's just uh, a joy for us to be able to spend a few few uh, hours with him today and I know that even if we're away, it's, it's, we're, we're still going to be remembered, and we're going to remember them too, and it's been just a wonderful time uh, together in the Lord. So, Lord, you know the needs of everyone in our hearts today. Whatever burden they're bearing, Lord, you will share it, and you will show us the right way to follow you. We pray for our nation, Lord, that America needs your, your blessing again. We know that there are struggles in, in God's people. If we start to be more faithful, if we are faithful and, and you will bless and bring revival in God's people, we'll see uh, the nation turned around. And uh, as far as the rest of the world goes, we do pray. Pray for Israel, too, and the safety of the war they're facing as, at the moment. And, Lord, you know all these things, and we just are grateful that you care about every need in our lives. And so we trust you today that we can um, rejoice in the Lord always, as Paul said, and and again, I say rejoice. So we thank you for what you do. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen and amen. Now, I would like to <coughs> ask you to open your Bibles this morning to the Gospel of John, Gospel according to John in the New Testament. And we'll start there. Keep your fingers working. We're going to move a little bit here and there, but I'll give you ample time uh, to do that. John chapter 20, I don't think I said that. So... In John chapter 20, you know this is the resurrection of Christ chapter. A lot of great things happening in this chapter. And primarily as you see how Christ uh, from verse 19 to the end appears to the disciples. And some great things are going on. And uh, in the beginning of that, it's, it's that evening, you know, it's after the resurrection. They're in the door. Uh, doors are closed. They're, they're assembled. They're afraid, they're afraid that they're going to be the next ones to be put on a cross and killed for their faith. And and uh, while they're in there without knocking on the door or even opening the door, Jesus walks through that door in his resurrected body. And I don't know how you and I would react to that, but I would be like them. I think we'd be afraid, but always like it when they, whenever Jesus does this, and so do angels when they come and make an appearance. They always say, you know, you know don't be afraid. <laughs> I always thought that was interesting. How would you like to be on this side when you see that? That is kind of a fearful thing. But praise God, Jesus said it in verse 19, at the end of that chapter, he came and stood in the midst and said, peace be with you. Now, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Why is that significant? 
if we looked at our hands, and as I get older, my hands are getting a little more worn out and bruised and all those things that go with aging. But do you realize, beloved, for all eternity, the only one that will bear the marks of sin in eternity in heaven is the Lord Jesus Christ because He took all our sins on Him. And now here He is in His resurrected body right in front of His disciples, and He said, Look at my hands and my side. Then His disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And He said to them, Peace to you as the Father has sent me. That's the, word, the, verse, the, the phrase I wanted to give you. I also send you. Now, <clears throat> in John 20, 21, it's amazing. But just before we get there, I want you to think with me a little bit. Now, we drive my, our dear friend, Dr. Tim Horner down in Illinois, uh, loaned us his Jeep to drive. It's been a lot of fun to drive. You know, I'd never had a Jeep before, and I saw somebody else had one in the parking lot, so we're kind of Jeep buddies. One of the things I've noticed as we travel all around America is you, when you drive a certain vehicle, you start noticing other vehicles that look like yours, or at least the brand. You know, isn't that amazing? That's kind of weird. I never did that before, but it's happening this time. And uh, so, some, so, some things you just notice, you know. And before you didn't, but then once, you, once you're having a certain car, you might, and maybe you've done that too. I don't know. But, but the reason I mention that is because it strikes me that the topic of missions is that way in Scripture, all right? It's everywhere, all right? It's everywhere. And if you're paying attention, <laughs> you'll begin to notice it. Now, I really like what this author, Robert Hall Glover, wrote in his book, The Bible Basics for Missions. This is a great thing. He said, the New Testament is uniquely and preeminently missionary. He said, the greatest missionary volume ever produced, every section of it was written by a missionary <laughs> with the primary obje object of meeting a missionary need and promoting missionary work. Praise the Lord. And he's got a point. And if you were with us the first hour, you know, we talked about the, the greatest missionary in the world is God himself, the Lord Jesus Christ, right? He came to seek and to save that which is lost. I'm great that he saved me. I wasn't raised in a Christian home. But thank God somebody from a church in my area knocked on the door and invited me to vacation Bible school. They said two things got my attention today. You can ride on the bus for free, and we have Kool-Aid and cookies. I said, what time will you be here? <laughs> you know, 10-year-old boys love that stuff. Needless did I know that by the third day of the whole first week of Bible school that summer, that they would put me in the class with the veteran, prayer warrior, gospel-leading Mrs. Jones, she was about 110 years old at that time. She had saved thousands of kids or led them to the Lord. God does the saving. But, yeah, but she's the one that wanted the 10-year-old bad boy. And man, only reason I know, by the way, and some of you may not know the date you were saved. You know the time that, that God changed your heart and made you a new creation. But I mean, you, I asked her one time before I left for Bible college, and she said, I, I, do, I keep records. Let me go check. So she came back to me and said, yeah, I checked in my book. It was on that day, and it was like Wednesday. So you had heard the gospel Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. End of stuff. You know? And now, so I praise God. for. I can't wait to get to heaven someday and thank her again, you know, for her love for little kids uh, and bringing the gospel to them. So in, 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 in light of that, I think, when I think about this comment in John 20, 21 from Jesus that, that the Father has sent me, even so send I you, it, it reminds me that this high watermark of Scripture's focus on missions is the Great Commission, or I would like to say the Great Commissions in a, in a plural sense. So our resurrected Lord, He culminated His time on earth with five complementary missionary assignments that first one is this one we just read here in John 20, 21, which focuses on the universal responsibility of believers. Right? He's talking to his disciples there. Now, we are also the children of God, so he's talking to us. Through the book of John, we read again and again almost 40 times, if you count them, almost 40 times that Jesus was sent by the Father. Here's a few. John 3, 34, earlier in the chapter, he said in the book, For whom he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. And in John 5, 23 and 24, it says at the end of verse 23, he who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. 
And verse 34, Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And so that's a marvelous thing to think about. He was, he was also quoted in, in Hebrews 3, 1, the ultimate apostle or the sent one, and Christ entirely completed his mission. How do I know that? Because John also recorded that for us. Uh, he said, Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of my Father who sent me and to finish his work. And you know, in his high priestly prayer in John 17, he said this, verse 4, I have glorified you on the earth. I finished the work which you gave me to do. There was two primary things. What was the work he was sent to do? To train up those 11, 12 disciples to bring the gospel to the rest of the world, which they did, and to go to the cross. In John 17, he hadn't been to the cross yet. But you notice he said, I've done the will of my Father. Was there ever any doubt in Jesus' mind that he was going to go to the cross for you and me? No. So in his mind, it was accomplished already. And he knew that from eternity past. Once the sin issue hit, it, hit the world with Adam and Eve's uh, disobedience and all of mankind was thrown into that, born with that sin nature and needed to be rescued from our own selves because there's no way we could do anything to save ourselves. And I hope today you're not trusting in any works or anything that you might have. You know, even though my, my God has blessed Sherry and I with, with uh, eight children, you know, we have a small tribe, you know, Josiah's the last of the crew. Uh, and our older ones are spread around the world. My oldest son, Chris, is living in Tennessee with his family. He has three children and another baby due in September. We hope to see before we go home to South Africa. Michael, his next brother, still pastors down in San Antonio, Texas, two older uh, teenage grandchildren there, a boy and a girl. So we have 18 grandchildren through them all. The twins have seven of those. Andrew has four, and Matthew has three. They are both missionaries in North Africa in a ministry together. And then after that, Stephanie married a Canadian, so she lives in Canada. And if you are a hockey fan, you just know that the Canadian, the, the Oilers just lost the, the, the Stanley Cup, and so my son-in-law is still crying about that because that's his favorite team. So pray that they get to someday win it again so he can stop crying, poor guy. But, I mean, I have two grandsons up there, and then, and then my next daughter lives in western Kentucky as a pastor husband, and they minister down there and three children there. And then we have Trevor, who was born in South Africa, some of you remember, and his daughter, he live up in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And then, uh, did I leave anybody out? I'm so sorry. So, Yeah, there we go. So that's the seven. And so we have 18 grandchildren, if you did the math. So we have equal number of boys and girls, and we have that new baby coming to break the tie. So number 19, we'll see <laughs> how it goes. Uh, but praise God, you know, I mean, that. if somebody would have told me that grandkids were so much fun, I would have started with that. But I guess you have to wait the, you wait the cycle, right? Anyway, praise God for all he does, and God is always faithful. Amen? He really is, and that's why I like this. We focus on the universal responsibility of the believer. Jesus says, the Father sent me, even so I am sending you. And you know, this word sent is the same, it's the same language that in the commit, when he commissions the church. And we're going to see that in the next ones that we look at, so... If you will, Jesus deputizes the church to carry, continue carrying out the mission of spiritual rescue and enable by the Holy Spirit to bring the gospel light to people. Christians like um, through us, but like Christ, have been sent into the world. Our orders couldn't be clearer. So what are we waiting for? We have a job to do, and God has the ability to help us get it done. So that was the first one. The second one is found... In Matthew 28, let's go over to Matthew's gospel and look at that. Matthew 28, and you're probably very familiar with this. So this also is the empty tomb resurrection passage, but then at the end we have the Great Commission that, that we're talking about here now, or as I'm, as I'm suggesting, commissions, while we look at all of them this time. But in this one, we focus on the universal authority of Christ. All right, look at what he says here. Verse 18, then Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority, the word authority in the original is exousia, and it means official right or person. You're going to understand why that's important in a minute. But all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Verse 20, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even till the end of the age of the world, amen. 
Okay. So that's why we say this is universal authority of Christ. Jesus has the authority to issue this life-dominating, world-changing command. Now, beloved, why do Christians have the responsibility, and let's be honest, the audacity? And I say that because I've even had people tell me in modern times that what we're doing is wrong. Going into another culture and trying to make them like an American church. Well, those of you who saw our picture this morning, that church didn't look, I mean, that was the church, but it didn't have the, we have benches, but they're not comfy seats like you got, <laughs> you know. A carpet, we're outside, we're, you know, we do with what we can. We didn't go there to make them the American church because they're not American. They're, they're a Zulu people, and they, but, they, but they have the Word of God, they have the same Savior, and so it works in His plan. That's what I think you'll see what He had in mind here when we talk about this. So do we have the audacity to do that, to take the gospel of Jesus Christ across culture and national boundaries? Yes, yes, because Jesus owns the earth. Right? All authority in heaven and earth is his alone. Not only does he have the authority to issue the commands, he has the authority to accomplish it. Amen to that. An otherwise impossible task is inevitable because an omnipotent hand is behind it. Right? Thus we go to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them then to identify them as God's own possessions and teaching them to obey Christ's commands. And the all-powerful God who sends us goes with us. Now, we do run into some trouble sometimes in our land where we go. I mean, Josiah mentioned that in a, in a all-black township, 100,000 people, there's crime is rampant. I mean, they have rules, but they're kind of uh, suggestions, right? And so, like, if you're a taxi guy and you encroach on somebody else's territory, you're going to pay for it, usually with your life, and that's what happened the day we came. They had shot and killed a guy having a funeral, Everybody was all upset. They're up shooting guns on the street, blocking your way through where we needed to get to the church in, at Mary to Johnny's house. And so as we come up on the crowd, we were stopped because everybody was around the car and escorted, looking like they were going to start banging up. But somebody tapping on the window saw Sherry. She rolled the window down, and she said, this lady, of course, they're all hyped up on alcohol and drugs, and so it's a very intense moment. So she said, I recognize you. You're the people that fed our kids during COVID. And, and you come out every week and give, us, and give our kids food still. You guys are okay. You can come too. You know? so, so she told everybody, get out of the way. Give them room. You know, we, couldn't get through the, we couldn't go that way to get where we had to. So we made a left turn safely in, in a couple of streets and went in the back way. But we still made it to church. By the time we finished the meeting that day and going home, that main road was cleared. Thank the Lord. Normally, they burn fire, tires, and things, and it just gets really dangerous. You say, why would you ever do that? In all the years we've been in that township, we're the only white-skinned people I've ever been in. Never seen another one. And you say, well, that's this God I'm talking about. The all-powerful Savior who sin, it sends us and goes with us. So we don't do foolish things, but we, we're careful about it. And even Mary will warn us if something's not right before we come to, to maybe not come that day. And so we, we listen to her, you know, because God knows what's best. So that's why we focus on the universal authority of Christ, because we serve a powerful God. Amen? And then there's a third one. It's in Mark's gospel. We're just going to go right through them. Let's go to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. Now, here we are again in the resurrection of Jesus, and in Mark 16, this one focuses on the universal proclamation of the gospel. Look at 15 and 16. Well, maybe after verse 14. After he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table and rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had sent him after he had risen. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Right? He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. That sounds like strong words, and it is, but truth is truth. This is how we need to focus on the universal proclamation of the gospel. Proclamation doesn't require a pulpit, does it not? It doesn't require a pulpit, nor, nor is it primarily a preacher's task. Listen, beloved, every Christian is a herald of the gospel and is responsible to announce it boldly and authoritatively. 
The universality of the work is emphasized twice by Mark. Our task is all-encompassing geographically. What did he say? Go into all the world. Right? And personally, every creature, every person. So we don't just take the gospel to regions or nations, but to individuals, showing them that faith in the dividing is the dividing line between forgiveness and condemnation. Why? Because look, verse 16 says, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. If you stay in your sins and you stand before God someday and He says, Why would I, should I let you into heaven? You say, Well, because I was a pretty good guy, never robbed a bank, never, you know, I was, you know, good to my neighbor, helped mow the lawn and whatever. Those are all good things, but that's not, you see, here's the misunderstanding most people have about heaven. Most people think good people go to heaven. That's not true. Only perfect people go to heaven. Now, when's the last time you looked in the mirror and saw someone, somebody perfect? I don't see one any time I look in the mirror. I'm definitely not perfect. Ask my wife. She's been around 46 years, still trying to get me correct, straightened out. And praise God for that. But, you know, through Christ you are perfect because in His righteousness, a holy God accepts you. But you can't go in on your own merit because all of our righteousness, as the great prophet said, Isaiah, are like filthy rags, right? And so we can't work our way to heaven, you know. But this, this is important, the proclamation of the gospel. So that's our third one. Let's, we're not far from the next one. Let's go to Luke 24, Matthew's gospel, uh, Mark's gospel, Luke 24, his gospel. And again, we're going to come right back to, to the resurrection chapter. We serve the risen Savior, right? And here it is. And this one, it focuses on the universal call to repentance. Now, this is good. Twice in Luke 24, Christ roots His saving work in the Old Testament. Let me show you. Look at verse 25. Verse 25. It's the next page for me. And following, he said, Then He said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken, Ought not the Christ who has suffered these things have entered into his glory? Right? Verse 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded them all the scriptures and things concerning himself. You want to go to a lifetime Bible college? Stand with Jesus when he teaches all that. Would that be amazing? Absolutely. And then later on, look at verse 44. He says, then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Does that mean Jesus believes in the Old Testament? Sure does. There's his testimonial. Some people say we got a New Testament. Nothing in the Old Testament matters anymore. No. God's word is always God's word, and he's got it there for a reason. There was a lot of mistakes made by the Israelites and people in the Old Testament, and if we're smart, we would avoid those mistakes. Amen? And learn from them. Then he goes on to say, verse 45, and he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Wow. Christ is the great, he is one of the master teachers. Uh, he, he certainly should be. It's his word. Amen. So while I regret not hearing those lectures as those guys did, what I'm glad to have is, if you will, the cliff notes here in the New Testament epistles, especially that Christ told us that His death and resurrection were promised and necessary. To what end then, beloved? What, why was that important? The, the, that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in the name to all nations. Now, you know, the tendency of many today is to just leave out this repentance part from the gospel. And that's a presumptuous perversion, I might add, because repentance was the message of John the Baptist. It was. In, in Matthew 3, this is what it says. In verse 2, it says, In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and here's what he said, verse 2. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Isn't that amazing? John the Baptist preached repentance. Guess who else preached repentance? Jesus. In Matthew 4, 17, from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, or draws near. So, yeah, it's important, absolutely important. And so do the apostles in the Acts chapter 2. They're preaching the same thing. God calls all people ever to repent and turn to Christ. 
because Acts 17.30 so clearly says. So listen, beloved, we are His witnesses, not filters. Okay, we're not filters. Now, um, this morning before uh, your equipping hour, we were having coffee. I, I love that about your church, too, that you have the fellowship there like that. That's wonderful. And um, the South Africans are big on fellowship, too. We have tea and coffee every week after our service as well. So when you come to visit, you'll, de you'll definitely get treated well. All right. But um, so we were talking about, the, you know, <laughs> one of the gentlemen here asked me why I was wearing a coat this morning. I said, well, it's not, you know, if you'd have told me I was coming in, in July in Iowa, I, it would be cold. I wouldn't have believed you. You know, it's like this global warming must be going on, you know. <laughs> But I have another thought. It's actually global cooling. All right? And uh, the reason I say that is because here's what, here's what Paul said in Romans 1.16. You're familiar with the verse. He said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Paul said, I'm not ashamed. For it is the power of God unto salvation. He finishes it by saying to the Jew first but also to the Gentile. But hey, that's true, right? So the apostle Paul, like all roads, was headed to Rome. And the believers in the imperial city were surrounded by such a, a muck of materialism that he would soon implore them, be not conformed to this world. That's Romans 12, verse 2. And in a Roman world of competing gods and compelling goods, we face that with the ancestor worship we told you about last hour in South Africa. That, that, that's an issue. It might have been easy for, it, for a believer to be shy with the gospel. So the cross certainly isn't posh, but Paul's crafted his masterpiece to ensure that the Roman brother knew that the gospel is potent. It's the power of God, potent. All right. Now, I often get a lot of questions, American missionary. They, they ask us, people here in America, how now that materialism has crept into your corner of the world, are people becoming colder to the gospel? <laughs> and I don't want to be rude. I, I want to chuck a little bit because, you know, they assume the world becomes more and more like one giant superstore and the numbing of the lure of stuff will hinder the gospel of advance. That's not true. Never is it true that that's, stuff is no match for the power of God. All right? And so what I say is, you know, my Bible tells me that until you're saved, you're dead in, in spiritually. So that a dead thing only is dead. We see things on the road to get run over. They stay pretty dead on the road, don't they? And and same thing is true spiritually. With um, and, and yeah, maybe perhaps in South Africa the Zulus become cold to the gospel, but not the unbelieving ones. The believers who are becoming cold—that's the concern. We've become materialistic, and we have lost our passion to save people from the fire, as Jude one twenty three reminds us. So. Lost people have, all, has all, have always been cold to the gospel. And to, to use the terminology of Paul's writing to Ephesians 2, they are dead to the gospel. So we expect corpses to be cold, but not the living. That's why Christians get rebuked for lukewarmness over in Revelation 3. That church, God said, I don't want you to be lukewarm. I want you to be hot or cold, but I prefer you to be hot, be on fire for God. There's a reason that God wants us that to be like that because the world doesn't know a God, holy God unless they see it demonstrated in our lives, the, the ones that represent Him. You ever wonder why when you get saved, you don't get, get transported immediately to heaven? That would have been a great thing, right? But no, He leaves us here because we have a job to do. Right? And so that, that's, that's fun. But, but our job is simply to proclaim the faith Faithfully and expectantly, yes, some will reject the truth and others will delay, but some will believe, as we see in, in Acts 17. Paul gives us that example, too. That's why every Wednesday preached the gospel. We need to let the gospel reignite our faith in its power to save. Now, there are some famous missionaries that we all know about that, that sometimes we... Um, um, I don't know. I don't know if you want to follow this guy's example, but let's think about, let's talk for a minute about souls and gourds. 
and you know I'm going a minute because I'm going to ask you to, when you get to heaven today, what's one of the Bible characters you're going to go and ask a story about? Here's one I want to talk to. I want to talk to Jonah and ask him about that big whale of a story he had. You know why? Because in Jonah chapter 4, later in your, before you have your nap this afternoon, go back and read this, you'll be blessed. God says to Jonah, he says, and should not I pity Nineveh, that great city? Now, why would God say that to his missionary? Well, Jonah wasn't exactly an example of missionary fidelity. When God said to go east, he went west. When God said to preach, he pouted. When God eventually coerced him to evangelize, he did so begrudgingly. Still, God used Jonah's message and saved an entire city, the greatest revival in human history. Think about it. Over 500,000 converts from one evangelistic meeting. So the book has a happy ending. Well, well almost. Almost. I mean, had I been asked to edit it, but there wasn't. But if I had, I probably would have suggested omitting chapter 4 altogether. You know why? Because chapter 3 has a nice feel-good conclusion. <laughs> you, but you need to stop right there. You need, if, you, if you run the credits after chapter 3, it might sound better. But the book continues taking that anticlimactic turn because Nola, Nineveh repents, God relents, and Jonah resents. <laughs> I mean, Ouch. But if we read Jonah 4 with fresh eyes, we'll see a bit of ourselves as well. Here's how. Like Jonah, we're better patriots than prophets. Jonah was displeased that God spared the Ninevites, Israel's enemies. And they were bad enemies. They weren't, gonna, they weren't good people. But I, like I said, no good people go to heaven, only perfect, right? In Christ. But listen. He was exceedingly angry. He said, I want to die angry. He, cha he charged God with incompetence, which, by the way, that's dangerous grounds going to God with that kind of complaint. But he, he did that, throwing the greatest revelation of God's glory from Exodus 34 in his face as an accusation. He, and Jonah said, I tried to avoid this. I knew you'd be gracious and forgiving. That's just like you. I mean, he knew he's God anyway. And it's disgusting. I pro probably wouldn't have said that to God, but he did. He, he, his hatred for the Ninevites was so deep that he lashed out at God with the destruction when it didn't come. And it's a telling statement. He recalled the good old days when he was back in his country rather than God forsaken, wished as he wished, for Assyria. And I have to admit, in, in my past, I had, I had a bone against Muslim people, especially after 9-11. And we were still in the islands then, and my boys and I were out witnessing, and um, I'd see these guys come and walking down the street, and I'd make a sarcastic comment. And I got rebuked by my sons. At that time, um, they weren't missionaries to North Africa, reaching out to 99.9% Muslim people. But God already, already knew where they were going, right? And I realized they needed Christ too, for sure. So I stopped doing that, you know? Sure, what happened to our country from those attacks were wrong, but doesn't mean everybody that from that background is responsible. So I, I guess like Jonah, I had I, I pouted, but God changed my heart. Thank God for that. And thank God that, that there was hope for him too. God wanted him to to do, but but he had that God forsaken wish that Assyria would be destroyed. He he he, then he, you know what he did? He exited the city and made himself an observatory at a safe distance. That's chapter 4, verse 5. And then he said, maybe God listened to my airtight reasoning and will destroy these pagans after all. Well, here's hoping. So see, we're like Jonah. We're sometimes better patriots than prophets. Because like Jonah, we get happy over the wrong things. The wrong things. There, though Jonah deserved to be destroyed for his blasphemous rebellion, God instead walked him through an object lesson. He started by giving Jonah a nice plant, probably some kind of a gourd, it says here in verse 6. Jonah wasn't all, he wasn't all sulk after all. For the only time in four chapters, Jonah was happy. His joy was extravagant. It says he was exceedingly joyful. Earlier, he was exceedingly upset, but now he's on the upper side of that emotion, which we can kind of be like that as people sometimes, can't we? Thank God God keeps his motion in check. 
not like that. And he's always faithful. He's always available. His word is always true. And he said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. That's the God we have. Amen? That's, that's what Jonah forgot. And, uh, but he was exceedingly joyful. He had been exceedingly angry. But what was the cause of all this mirth? Well, it's a stupid plant. <laughs> he turned around and said, there's this plant, right? And it was keeping him shaded. But um, it, it's kind of hard. I like plants, too. I raise plants in South Africa, but I'm not like a tree hugger kind of guy. I mean, if you're a plant person, great. If you have a green thumb, my grandma used to, amen, go for it. But look, um, I, I, it was hard, it, it's hard to understand how he was getting way too happy over this really insignificant plant. And, and I think I'm more like Jonah than I like to admit. Here's some thoughts in that light, and maybe you can relate. Sure, people are perishing every minute of the day. But what about that ball game, that Iowa State team or Iowa team to whichever one you support? Half, half the world is closed to the gospel, but have you seen the new iPhone? The world is steeped in idolatry, and boy, my lord, looks good. Look how nice it looks, keeping them in good order. Yeah, like Jonah, we get happy over the wrong things, huh? But also like Jonah, we get angry over the wrong things. God's living parable wasn't finished. He sent a worm to eat the gourd and then a sultry wind to make its absence felt. That pushed Jonah over the edge. Once again, he asked for death. How dare God destroy my innocent plant? I love that thing. Has he no pity? His response is over the top. And again, I can relate. What really burns me up is this is the gourds of life. Maybe you have a few of these too. Was that den in my car really necessary, God? Don't you care? Have you seen that laundry pile? My life is a wreck. My stocks are down, and again, my weight's out of control. Really? Thanks for nothing, God. It's like it's God's fault. Jonah was upset, was set up for the moral of the story, you know, as are we. He pitied a disposable plant. He had nothing, he had neither made nor nurtured. If nothing else, the sudden eco conscious prophet should have cared for the city's cattle. Even God said to him in verse 11, chapter 4, even the cattle are important. Yet he faulted God for saving a great city of people, of children whom God had made and who would live forever someday. And that's where the story ends with God's probing question Should not I pity? And it's, sad, it's, it's unsatisfying, but it leaves us to wonder the missionary implication of this question. Shouldn't God pity the lost? Shouldn't we? And if we let the gospel inspire us to live as though souls are more significant than gourds, then we won't be lost in it like Jonah was. All right? So that said, back to our thoughts about the... Great commissions, I've given you four. I said there'd be five, and you're not surprised to find this one in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And it's funny that you say this. I have one of my prayer cards, uh, our bookmarks, our mission put out. It says to follow God in this on here, Acts 1, 8. But the interesting thing about this picture is this picture was taken in Zaire, now the DRC, many years ago with a missionary that we were going to work with there. And this boat that's on the side of the Sanku River, I've actually traveled on when I was in the country in 1988. So it's kind of special to me, you know, to think about that. But look at that verse. What does it say? God says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea. Now, it's sometimes an interesting, sometimes an interpretation that's popular, all right? in Christian culture, hijacks the intended meaning of the text. And I'm on a I hope I can explain this well. You take Acts 1, 8, for example. If you do, take your phone and you do a, a word search. I challenged my people one time with, with a message in South Africa. I said to them, I said, here's a question that you can't Google and get an answer for. <laughs> and you all say, What's it? what is it? What is it, mister? Well, here it is. What does Christ mean to you? We ought to try that. I wonder what the computer would say. The computer has no idea what Christ is, but 
I mean, in a real sense. What does Christ mean to you? So, so if you do a web search on, on this verse in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, they'll usually say things like this. Where is your Jerusalem? Where is your Samaria? As if the main point of the verse is that every church down through the centuries has to become the Jerusalem and repeat the steps that the first church took. That kind of, at first reading, that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? And if all we're thinking about when we read Acts 1.8 is, where is our Jerusalem? Then here's the thing, we're subjectivizing objective truth. It's all about us then, isn't it? And we're missing something really, really huge that Jesus is doing. Now, so what's that huge thing that Jesus is doing? I'm glad you asked. He's using a multidimensional approach to prophecy that the apostles would have recognized from the Old Testament because they were very Old Testament wise because they didn't have a New Testament like we do, right? They lived the New Testament, which now is recorded. You know, isn't it amazing when you talk about history, of all of man's history, it's really about his story. His story. Amen? That's really what it's about. So Israel prophets had, in the Old Testament, Israel prophets often gave a short-term and a long-term prediction. If the short-term prediction fizzled, there's no need to wait around for the long-term. That guy's a false prophet. Forget him. And there were a lot of those. All right? But if the short-term prediction happened, well, then the rest was guaranteed. Now, keep that thought in mind as we look at this. Jesus is doing the same thing here in Acts 1.8. The disciples need some serious encouragement. I mean, in a few minutes, the Lord will be leaving them, and they're going to go back to the city. This is when he's about to go up in his ascension, back to heaven. So, so they need, in, in those few minutes, they need the Lord. He know, they know they're going to go back to that city that's famous for killing the prophets. And uh, I wrote a verse down because I, it, it's important to remember. Matthew 23, 37. Jesus said, O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I've wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. So that's what he's going to do now. And this is not a time for, uh, in these final words, when Jesus leaves, and this is not a time for a missionary strategy pep talk about reaching your Jerusalem and your Samaria. No, it's time for the most audacious short-term and long-term predictions that a prophet ever gave. Here's the first one. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You see, the Holy Spirit is the key to everything that follows. But you really think that these scaredy-cat apostles are going to turn Jerusalem upside down without the boldness of the Spirit? There's no way. No way. How are they going to turn the world upside down without the power of the Spirit in their life? Or reach across the impossible chism to hated Samaritans without the love of the Spirit? Or to make God's famous, famous to the ends of the earth without the endurance of the Spirit? We had an experience when I pastored in Johannesburg back in the 90s at Corning Baptist Church. And, you know, South Africa is very mineral rich in the world uh, resource-wise. And they bring experts in from around the world, especially in the mining industry. And they brought in a young man who uh, in one of the mining companies, he was living in our community, he was an Indian fella, and when he introduced himself to me, his, his name was Thomas. And a uh, Christian man, his family was lovely. We got to see how God used him greatly. They came, came to our church, stayed in our church. And, and anyway, so then I got curious and asked him, I said, uh, yeah, you, <clears throat> I said, you, you introduced his name as Thomas. What's your last name? He said, Thomas. No, I said, I know it's your first name. He said, no, my name is Thomas Thomas. I said, there's a story here, right? Yeah, oh yeah. He said, I come from a part in India where the Apostle Thomas brought the gospel. And our village was so delighted to hear about a God that loved them and provided salvation. They said, we're going to start naming. They said, this is, the, this is the missionary that was come to us. Our kids are going to be named after him. And so my name is Thomas Thomas. Wow, that's pretty amazing. By the way, if you remember, that Thomas wasn't in the upper room on the first Resurrection Sunday. And when he heard from his buddies that Jesus had been there, he said, well, I, 
I'm not going to believe until I can put my hands in the nail prints of his hand and put my fist up in the side where that spear went. I, I only believe that. And he told his friends that. You've got to be careful what you say out loud or even what you think because God knows these things. Look at me. I lived in Colorado and I had friends from Iowa tell me about the cold winters here. And I made this stupid comment. I said I would never live in Iowa. Yeah, God said, we'll see. So I got three winters here and I said, yep. Yeah. Send me to a warm climate, God, please. <laughs> Found out right away up here in Holland, Iowa. There's nothing between Holland, Iowa and the Canadian border but a barbed wire fence. <laughs> the winds are blowing. But hey, he made the, the next time, week later, they're up there, and this time Thomas is there. What happens? Jesus walks through the door again. He just, of course, you never misplace your keys. Yeah, he did too. He didn't need them. <laughs> through the door, locked door. Why were they in there? They were still scared because. Technically, there should have been three more crosses with uh, 11 more crosses with these disciples hung up, and they were afraid that's going to happen to them. What happened to Jesus? Oh, well. Thomas, then Jesus goes right to Thomas, and he said, all right, here I am. Put your hands there. You see, God knows all things. And what did Thomas' response say? He's down on his knees before his Lord, my Lord and my God. And what Jesus said him, to him that day was to you and me. He said, Thomas. You believe because you see, but blessed are they which have not seen. He's talking about us and everybody since and everybody till he comes again. Wow. So this is, this is why they, they needed to, to understand what he had in mind. And so the Holy Spirit is the only one who could keep all these things from falling apart. That's why those guys were able to do it. So in this new thing called the church today, it's going to take the world with the gospel. The Holy Spirit isn't going to do the same thing He did in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, it was come and see. You, you remember? The prophets were there in Israel, and uh, that famous captain of the soldier, Naaman, had leprosy, and he found out that, that pro somebody sent him there said, there's a prophet there, he could help heal you. And so he came to see the prophet. The prophet didn't even get out of his den, his office, and come see him. He sent his fellow worker. He said, go down to the Jordan River and dip in seven times. You can go home. Clean. And the guy was put out. He said, we had cleaner, cleaner, nicer rivers back in our home country. So he fussed about it. He fussed about it. But thank God, God sent a little missionary girl that worked, slave girl, and said, look, if the prophet told him to do it, it was a good reason. God, that's how God works. And so at least let him do it. So his wife convinced him, thank you, wife, for convincing us hard-headed husbands we need to do the right thing. So he goes down to the river, and he goes down the first time, he comes up with leprosy. He goes down the second time, still has leprosy. He goes down the third time, has leprosy. He's getting tired of this. It's like, whew, it's not working. Well, I'm here. I'm already wet. Fourth time, nothing. Fifth time, nothing. Sixth time, nothing. He figures it's all over. Seventh time, he goes down, he's up, and he's healed. Healed. Why? Because God was telling people then to come and see what God is doing. Another example of that would be uh, Queen of Sheba. She came out of Africa, come up to see the, the, the famous wisdom of Solomon, and she was just blown away at what God was doing. That was the way God wanted that to happen back then. Come to Israel where God's spirit-filled prophets are preaching. Come to Jerusalem where God's spirit-filled uh, priests are ministering in God's temple. But Jesus now inaugurates in the new age of a Holy Spirit power. It's no longer come and see. It's go and tell. Go and tell. Every city becomes a holy city. Every people becomes the chosen people. Every church and every believer becomes a holy temple. So what if this first prediction had fizzled? Well, that's the end of the story. Game over. I mean, Jesus is a false prophet. But it didn't fizzle, did it? It exploded. I mean, the Spirit came in power. You can check it off the list. So, so the next thing is, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea. All right? You hear this proclamation through the ears of the apostles, and you'll see how impossible it sounds. Humanly speaking, the mission to reach Jerusalem should have ended with 11 more crosses at Golgotha. Yet, 
Here was the risen Lord telling them that they wouldn't get snuffed out. They would successfully make Jesus famous in Jerusalem and Judea. I find it interesting. You ever wonder when Jesus tells you something, do we really listen? I mean, the time they got in the boat to go to the other side and he falls asleep from ministering in the day, he's tired, and the storm raises up there in the Sea of Galilee, the ship's about to sink, and they wake him up and he said, Lord, <laughs> save, save us, we're about to drown. And being a good God he was, he didn't say, do you not remember I said we're going to the other side? Since when can any enemy of the Lord, the creator of the universe, sink a boat when he's in it? But don't be too hard on the guys because you and I would have thought the same way. I mean, you know, storms are scary, right? But that's just the kind of God we serve. I mean, he is just amazing in what he does. They would successfully make Jesus famous in Jerusalem and Judea. Well, did it happen? Well, because I need to know. Maybe you're wondering today, too, because if it didn't, I'm checking out. No, maybe there's no, nothing else for me here. I, I'm not waiting around. I'll go and find a Savior I can trust. But it did happen. History records it. And it happened in a big way. 3,000 people in one day, 5,000 more a little later. I mean, wow, praise God. You can check it off the list. Two down. There are two to go. Let's let the gospel change our perception about the, His promises that will always come true. See, we, we would never teach the account of the crucifixion and then immediately ask, what is your Calvary? Would we? I mean, as important as it is it, it, for us to follow the example of Calvary, it's not even one millionth as important as what Christ did on Calvary. Yet that's often how Acts 1-8 is handled. The where is our Jerusalem or Judea or Samaria paradigm is muted the main purpose of the text, which is to authenticate the prophetic status of the Lord Jesus, to predict the glorious victories of the gospel, and to provide strong encouragement for the church. That's why we bring our report to you as your missionary, so you can see what God is doing. And, and, and as we saw, saw earlier, Christ nailed the first two predictions about the coming of the Holy Spirit and the evangelization of Jerusalem and Judea, so we can just, that checklist, we got it done. We check it off the list. It means that we don't have to go back and evangelize Jerusalem again. And, of course, every generation needs the gospel. I mean, you know, yeah, we, we may have to, to rework it. If Christ can't get the short-term prediction right, no sense waiting around for those other things he said to do. But he did get them right, which brings us to these two more things. You will be my witnesses in Samaria. Samaria, question mark. The disciples had just asked the Lord about what he was going to when he was going to restore Israel. And now he's talking about Samaria. If the thought of evangelizing Jerusalem was scary, evangelizing Samaria was just plain disgusting. <laughs> Lord, they're not like us. Do you see that this third prediction is nothing less than the promise that the gospel of Jesus Christ will plunge a cross-shaped dagger right into the heart of racism? According to the book of Ephesians, a colorful church is a testimony to the whole world, seen and unseen, that the cross has power to tear down racial walls. And that had been standing for hundreds and even thousands of years. Paul writes about it in Ephesians chapters 2 and 3. Here in Acts 8, the walls started tumbling. So where are we on our checklist? The Holy Spirit would come powerfully and inaugurate this new age. The city and nation that killed Jesus would be reached for Christ. Happened. Once hated Samaritans will be brought to the gospel family through the gospel. That also happened. So what's left? You will be my witnesses to the end of the earth. Can we check that off? Well, yes, we might as well because we know from the fulfillment of the short-term predictions that the final long-term prophecy will come to pass without fail. But no, the gospel hasn't yet not gone to the very last tribe and tongue and people group, though we know it all, uh, know it will. So one of the problems with the what is our Jerusalem idea is that if we keep thinking of our own city as Jerusalem, we fail to see the breathtaking fact that our churches are part of the fulfillment of the final prediction. We're talking about the Great Commission. When the Lord spoke these prophecies, few places on earth were even more remote than Tama, Iowa, let's say, or Kwanengezi, Kezi in South Africa. And... These places define the end of the earth. Yet all these places and thousands in between believe churches where God is worshipped through Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
So you say, well, okay, missionary Brian, so what? Well, what does all this short-term, long-term stuff mean anyway? Just that Jesus is Lord. Amen to that. That God is real and the Bible is trustworthy. And that the gospel is powerful. That every tribe and nation will come to Christ. That Jesus will return. That's all. And that's a lot. Amen? Let's let the gospel's past victories inspire our present and future faith. You read about people in the Bible that say, Lord, increase our faith. We need that too. The world is changing. But this eternal word is eternal. And we can trust it. We can take it. We can take it to the ends of the earth. Just like in that boat on the Skanker River, 1988, those people heard the gospel. Many of them got saved. You'll see them in heaven. Just like the ones you saw this morning from Quanagazi. They're going to say, you'll see them in heaven. And there's more. There's room. How, how big is heaven? Pretty big. There's plenty of room. You remember what Jesus said in John 14? He said, you believe the Father, believe also me. That in my Father's house are three mansions. If you have a new translation, that's what it says. No, I'm just kidding. Many mansions. Many is kind of like a lot, right? If it were not so, he said, I would have told you. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if, the word if means since I'm going to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. When the roll call for Tamer Church is called, you'll be there. If you haven't joined the team yet, trust Christ today and be in the family of God forever and ever. Amen. Ah, it's a joy to serve God in His ministry, watch Him work and change lives. Thank you for your faithfulness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, today we are humbled by the truth of Jesus' words in these passages that are so true. It's His commission to us as believers, His ambassadors to reach a world with the gospel. It's a big task, but you're a big God. There's nothing you can't do. You are able are we willing to trust you and obey? Because as we know the song says, there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. And Lord, we want you to be happy in our serving you by being faithful in, in doing that. So Lord, today, speak to the hearts, those who need encouragement, those who need a step of faith, you'll give an answer today as your word has all those answers for us and your promises are always true. So help us to always trust and obey and be glad be a part of the family of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Amen. Please stand and sing if you're able. We're going to sing our last song. It's Lord, I Lift Your Name on High. your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth. sing your praises I'm so glad you're in my life I'm so glad you came to save us you came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross my debt to pay from the cross to the grave from the grave to the sky Lord I lift your name
give us a benediction? That would be great. Thank you. Heavenly Father, today we are rejoicing in you because you have called us to a holy calling to be in Christ and to be more than conquerors. And we have a victory we already won. And so, Lord, we know how, the, how it's all going to end because you are uh, an om- omnipotent God. You are all power and sovereign. So, Lord, today I pray we would just glorify your name throughout this Lord's Day and take a minute or two to um, speak a word of good truth or give a gospel tract to someone in need and just give a meaningful uh, witness to you today. Thank you for the privilege we have had today to be here to worship and to to uh, fellowship together in Christ. We pray your blessing as we go home and for safety. Thank you again until the uh, meeting. They're able to come back for the next meeting. Be blessed in Jesus' name.